I have so missed y'all. If you're a veteran Awakenings gal, you know that I have not been here for two weeks. That is a rare thing. And I'm going to schedule my life so it never happens again. I so miss being in the presence of the Lord, in the presence of my sisters. Uh, there's an anointing here, um, an impartation for life. Uh, God is so kind to visit us. I don't know if you perceived it during our worship just now, but he's here. He's here. The word says it's the anointing of God, his presence, his Shekinah glory. It's the anointing of God that breaks the yoke. How many women in here today have a yoke over your life that needs to be broken? Just being in the presence of the anointing will break yokes. Will break yokes. That's what we have faith for this morning. Um, I, I can't be gone because I, I'm overcome with FOMO. <laughs> On a Thursday morning, if I'm not in this room, FOMO, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, is fear of missing out. And I think, what are they doing now? What are they doing now? What are they doing now? I'm missing it. Um, when I'm gone, I kind of feel disjointed. So I want to take a few minutes. I've, I've kind of, as of this morning, been redirecting what I believe God has for us in, the, in our flow um, of his spirit this morning. And so um, we're, I'm going to share a little bit today. I, have, I feel to give a testimony um, that I think uh, we are we overcome revelation said by the the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony so I believe that there's an anointing for overcoming in this place today so I want to share uh, a testimony which is going to kind of carve my what I was going to share up a bit so this is part one of at least a two-part talk will be continued next week and possibly a three-part talk that'll be continued the following week. I wanna, I wanna reserve the right, reserve the right to, uh, so I wanna do just a bit of a review. So the very first week, we were in Acts 20, verse 32, Acts 20, verse 32. Paul has called together the Ephesian elders and he's impassioned. And he says to the Ephesian elders, he's, this is the last time he's gonna be with them. As he, and he says in Acts 20, 32, And now I entrust you to God and to the message of his grace. I entrust you to the word, the message of his grace. Some uh, translations uh, render it the, the word of his grace. Now I, I entrust you to the word of his grace, which, Paul said, is able to build you up. This right here, y'all. I can't overstate what, what the revelation that God has given us in this word. If you, don't, if you aren't hungry to be in this word, ask God to implant a hunger in you for this word. That we just, you just ingest it. Just, just take it in. Um, I was chatting with a, a girl this week, and she shared that her um, husband was dealing with lots of fear. And immediately the word came to my mind that perfect love cast out fear. So I began to just pray and just say, Lord, let your perfect love reign in that household. It'll cast out fear. The other thing that came to my mind is a scripture in Philippians 4 where Paul says, think on these things, things that are true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. And he says, and the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will reign in your heart. So I said to her, start, start just thinking on things. Bring, bring every thought captive to things that are true and noble and right and pure. You know, if you get off uh, thinking about what's going on in our culture or you get off thinking about your problems, you can dive right into fear. Dive right in deep, deep into fear. I mean like have a panic attack kind of fear, right? Right? Hyperventilate kind of fear. It's out there, and it's crouching, right? 
Paul says, if you want the peace of God to reign in your heart, think on things that are true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Set your mind on those things. So, so, the Word, the Word is able to build us up, Paul says. The Word builds us up. And he goes on, Acts 20, 32. This is such a rich. And now I entrust you to God, to the message of his grace that's able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those he set apart for himself. The first week we were together, we talked about how the, a word unlocks. We sent home each of, each of you with a key. The word unlocks the inheritance. This is a testament, old and new, like a last will and testament. You, after the death, you, you go and you read the last will and testament. And it, it lists all that's in the inheritance. This is our testament. And at the cross, Jesus secured for us. He opened up the kingdom and the inheritance to us. It's all in here. This, this testament unlocks, it unlocks the inheritance, Paul said. It's all in here. Ashley taught a couple weeks ago um, out of number six, which, was that not wonderful? Those of you that were here, she and I had chatted about number six. It's so intriguing to me. This is the, the high priestly blessing for those of you that weren't here. For those of you that weren't here, you can access all of the podcasts from Awakenings on YouTube. Um, so let me invite you to, to do that. If you've not heard her um, sharing about this, it's very good two weeks ago. Um, Acts, I mean, number six, 24 to 26 says this, um, the high priestly blessing. The Lord said to Moses, this is the way I want you to bless the people and have the, the priests bless the people the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace it's number 6 24 to 26 but in verse 27 there's something very intriguing that the Lord then says to Moses he said so by doing speaking this blessing so shall, shall you put my name upon the people. Is that not intriguing? So shall you put my name. What he was saying is, so shall you invite them into the family. You're going you're gonna to put my name on them. They're going to be mine. Ashley used a wonderful illustration of her, her marriage to Barrett um, and how she, she took his name. Um, as a bride often will take the name of her groom, Ashley took the name of Johnson. She married Barrett Johnson, and she took his name. And she said even though she came into the marriage with debt, a significant debt, um, that, that because she bore his name, because she was his, she received from him an inheritance, and her debt was canceled. Her debt was paid. It's a wonderful illustration of what happens when we say yes. When we say yes to the inheritance. We're going to talk a little bit more about that today, so I won't um, say more about that right now. The, then last week, Ashley taught about what she uh, called defiant joy. Is that not a great title? Defiant Joy. Stacy Eldris has written a wonderful book called Defiant Joy, and um, that's kind of what Ashley leaned into last week, Defiant Joy. Um, it's part of our inheritance. It's part of our inheritance. Joy. It's part of our inheritance. And not happiness kind of joy. Now, sometimes it's just exhilaration and happiness, is it not? The kingdom. Tony Campbell wrote a book years ago. It's the kingdom of God's a party. There's a lot of good stuff. There's a lot of good stuff. Doesn't mean that, that, that there's not weeping. Doesn't mean that we don't walk through hard things. But sometimes the joy that we walk in, I would declare to be defiant joy. Right? 
happens, not, not flippant, not joy as the world gives. I was reminded as I was thinking about um, defiant joy of a story I heard years ago, and I just love it. I think I may have shared it before, but those of you that you're not going to remember it, you're just going to enjoy it as if for the first time. Alexander M. Saunders, Jr., who was at one time the chief judge of the South Carolina Court of Appeals. So he was the chief judge of the South Carolina Court of Appeals. He spoke to the graduating class of the University of South Carolina in 1992. His daughter, Zoe, was a member of that class. So because she's graduating, she had somehow finagled her father, who's the chief judge of the South Carolina Court of Appeals, and he is speaking at her graduation. And Saunders uh, uh, told a story about when Zoe, his daughter, now graduated from college when she was three years old. He said she came, he came home from work one day to find a crisis brewing in their household that a Zoe's pet turtle that she loved very much had died and she was crying her heart out. His wife, so glad when he stepped in the door, right, how many of us are so glad for that, turned the problem right over to him and said, you, you can handle this. There have been, there's been much weeping and gnashing of tea. It's now yours to deal with. First, Mr. Saunders explained that that was, you know, he, tried, he tried to calm her down by doing what a lot of us would do. He would go to the pet store, right, and get her another turtle, right? He got nowhere with that. Zero, zero. Zoe knew that life couldn't be transferred from one turtle to another. She wanted her turtle alive, her old turtle, and she continued to cry. Then Mr. Saunders said, um, I'll tell you what, we'll have a funeral for your turtle. We'll have a funeral. Being three years old, Zoe didn't know what a funeral was, so, so she asked, and he said, a funeral is a great festival we're going to have in honor of your turtle. She didn't know what a festival was, so he said, a funeral is like a magnificent birthday party. We'll have ice cream and cake and lemonade and balloons and all the children in the neighborhood will come over to play all because the turtle has died. Zoe's tears began to dry up and she returned to her happy self. She loved the idea of having a funeral. As they were standing there next to the aquarium at this moment, an utterly unforeseen thing happened. They looked down and the turtle began to move. <laughs> he wasn't dead after all. In a matter of seconds, he was crawling around as lively as ever. Mr. Saunders didn't know what to say, but Zoe appraised the situation perfectly. With all the innocence of a three-year-old, she looked up at her dad and father and she said, Daddy, let's kill him. <laughs> right? Joy can be fleeting. Right? It's like a ship with no rudder. You have it, you don't. You have it, you don't but not God's joy. That is not God's joy. God's joy is deep and rich. It's what Paul was saying in Philippians 4 when he said, I've learned the secret of contentment in every situation, whether full stomach or hungry, plenty or want. I'm content. He also went on, he said, rejoice always. Rejoice. It's God's plan, Ashley said, to give us his joy. Jesus said in John 15, Abide in me, and I'll abide in you, and my joy will be full. My joy will be full. It's not, it's not flippant. It's a, it's a deep reservoir of thanksgiving. 
thankfulness, joy that only he can give. I wanted to share a testimony as, as Ashley was sharing this last week, I felt like I was living it. So I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a bit of a testimony. So our family, the uh, week before last, we, we had made plans to go to Disney World. Our family for years has taken this trip because my parents decided many, many years ago that as a gift to our extended family, every Christmas they gave us a trip to Disney World. And we would all pack up and pile into cars or on planes and every January head off to Disney World. We've done that for years. Uh, My mother passed away several years ago and then in March, my dad passed away. And so we had a family meeting after the death of my father and said, do we, how do we feel about the trip? Because this Christmas, this past December, that was not going to be a gift coming from my father for the extended family. Did we still want to make the trip? And pretty much unanimously, the family said, yes, let's, let's do the trip and we'll do it in honor of granddaddy. And so we made plans. I tend to be the cruise director for our family. Most families have somebody in the family that's the cruise director. That tends to fall to me, and I own it. I happily own it. I love to plan. So I had planned this trip, long getting everything ready, hotel reservations and, you know, Airbnb type stuff, and I had, we'd gotten tickets and made all provision, made restaurant reservations, and I mean, it was, it was complicated. I had everything written down. I had everything laid out. And um, off, off we went. My husband and I went down early. Alan and I went down early um, and uh, just to kind of be ready. I felt like even though I wasn't hosting this at all, everybody's kind of on their own, I felt kind of like the hostess with the mostess, you know. And um, so uh, the first uh, night that the, the family all arrived, we were all there, we had a lovely meal together. It was wild, uh, wild, 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 and uh, but delightful, right? We had two three-month-old babies as part of the gathering, and uh, it was lively. It was lively. I had been for days prior to the arrival of the family eating my Wheaties <laughs> and getting ready, right? And so we had this wonderful dinner. And as we're saying goodbye, as, as we're, everybody's heading out after the dinner together, we're heading to our prospective rooms where we'll kind of launch the, the trip the next morning. Officially, my son, my grown son, said to me as he was leaving, I don't feel very good. Of course, I did what your mothers do. You're going to be fine. <laughs> You're going to be fine. Now, just think on things that are true and noble, (laughs) right and pure, right? Here's some DayQuil, here's some Advil, right? And go make yourself better. (laughs) I want to hear good things in the morning. Now, sleep well. But we did. We prayed for him that night. I told Alan, I said, he said, Bennett didn't seem himself. I said, let me tell you why. (laughs) He's not feeling good. Well, we got the call early the next morning that Bennett was not well, running a high fever, chills, very ill. So we invited my, his wife, my daughter-in-law, and their three-month-old, my <laughs> granddaughter, to come be with us, which she did. Um, and she spent the day with us. Whereupon that evening, as she was leaving, she turned to me and she said, I don't feel very good. And the following morning at 6.30, we were waked up to a call from her saying, I am not well. Can you come get the three-month-old? <laughs> and thus ensued, uh, we took, my son was so sick that we ended up taking him to the urgent care and uh, flu, flu, he had flu. Um, of the 11 adults and two children on the trip, Seven spent the entire time with the flu. Me being one of them. After caring and caring, and Alan and I were kind of being as, you know, the matriarch and the patriarch of the trip, and we're kind of taking care of everybody. 
and midweek I started not feeling good and I knew that my time was limited you, you, you ever have that it's coming the scratchy throat I'm starting to cough I'm starting not to feel very good and I can tell I'm starting to run a fever you know that kind of thing I did not want to tell Alan I did not want to, because we are, I, the, you know, it reminded me of the Pilgrims, honestly, y'all. I love history. But, you know, the Pilgrims, they came over here. I can't remember the number. There are like 110 of them that actually land and form the settlement, and 52 of them, like, died the first year, right? I mean, about half of them, not fully half, but about half of them. And the other half are having to care for them. That's like we were, we were the Pilgrims, <laughs> right? Half of us are taken out, more than half. And, and you got, we got babies that are sick, so we're like, do we need to go to the emergency room? You know, is this fever, how high is this fever? Um, it, was, it was not just we're, we're sick, we're going to lay in bed. It was sick, all hands on deck, do we need doctors? We were calling doctors, we were on the phone with, we had, anyway. Um, I started feeling it coming on. And uh, Alan came in our bedroom at one point to say, okay, here's what's going to happen. You're going to feed the baby the bottle, and I'm going to be the baby the bottle, and we're trying to. And I said, <laughs> and he said, no, no, no. No. <laughs> no. He said, don't tell me you're not feeling good. I said, and then I felt terrible for him. I said, I'm sure I'm fine. I'm sure I'm fine, but I'm feeling just a little puny at this moment. Moment, I'm feeling a little puny. He said, please don't. You can't. You can't be sick. Don't get sick. You can't be sick. So this continued to progress in me, and people are just, they're dropping like flies. You know, we've got them everywhere. Y'all, I was at Disney World for a week. I never saw the castle. I didn't come anywhere near the entrance of the Magic Kingdom. Not near, not near. My main job was canceling. <laughs> Alan woke me up early one morning and said, if you cancel for today, we'll have to pay if you don't cancel. I mean, I rose up. Don't, don't, we don't, we're not coming to that reservation. We're not coming to that reservation either. We're not coming to any reservations. <laughs> One afternoon, I, I, as the, the evening that I was feeling, I was starting to feel bad, and I felt like this is just not, not only were we being robbed, you know, we're all feeling bad, but this was to be a time of memory of my father in honor of my dad. My sister and I had planned really some special moments with the grandkids, that we were going to talk about my dad's will with them and his heart for them, right? We're not, there's not happening. That's not happening. Nobody, we can't get everybody. We never got together again. We had that one meal that Bennett left and said, I don't feel very good. That was our only time together. So the night that I was not feeling good, I said, I've got to just, if I get out and I walk a bit, just, it's, you know, it's a beautiful day and I get outside and I walk a little, it's going to, It'll help. So I went out and I was walking and I was having a discussion with the Lord. And you all have had these discussions, right? About how you, you really know how it could be better. And, and if, and if you, you showed him the way that, that it could be better and it, would, and it would be rich and nourishing for his, the people that know him and a witness to those that don't. Right? There's, there's power that could happen if he just heal everybody instantaneously. So we're having that discussion, and I really knew better. And I was, I was kind of espousing some of my ideas for how the rest of the week could go and, and questioning what, what possibly could be the thinking that was going on here. And um, I came around to bend, and God doesn't speak to me through nature usually, but he will arrest my attention sometimes with something in nature. And then when he has my attention, he'll speak to me. And that's what he did that evening. Let me, Ben, we have a picture. I want you to see what I saw. I came around to bend, and I want you to see the picture. Yeah. And I saw that. 
And, and y'all, this is what I heard. I'm embarrassed. I almost decided I wasn't going to tell this. But this is what I heard. Therefore, I knew it was God. He said to me, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? I didn't know where that was, but I knew it was in the book of Job. And I didn't at all hear it as a rebuke. I heard it as him saying, I've got this. I've got this. And do you trust me? Do you trust me? Are you going to trust me? Where, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you? And at that, that moment, I heard the words defiant joy. I had a choice, right? Yeah. I'm going to be just overcome by misery, or I'm going to declare God to be the author and finisher of my faith, and for God to be good all the time, and for God to be in control. I don't understand what's going on here. Alan, every time I got with my husband, and I, listen, I'm a lover of Romans 8, 28. God makes all things work together. All things. Not a few things, not some things. God makes all things work together for our good and his glory. Every time I saw my husband and he's running around, he's got a bottle in one hand, he's burping one, and he's, he's taking Tamiflu to somebody else, and it, it just, he's got an apron on, and he's just saying to me, Romans 8, 28, Ann, Romans 8, 28, are you agreeing with me? I said, I got it, Romans 8, 28, Romans 8, 28. He's working all things, even this massive mess, he's working it for good. Do I believe that? Do I believe that? God said, do you trust me? Do you trust me? And I felt joy. I felt joy come up in me. Right? I felt it. And I thought, this is defiant joy. It's defiant in the face of the circumstances. Right? It's the joy of the Lord in the midst of the circumstances. I said, yes. Yes, I do trust you. And your ways are not my ways. They're higher and they're better. You don't want us to settle. You've got good things for us. I do not understand this. I do not understand it. But I'm yours. I'm yours and you're working out a magnificent plan. I contacted um, some women. You, you need to know that every woman in this room, every woman uh, involved in awakenings, under the sound of my voice, you are prayed for every week. You are prayed for every week. I count on that prayer. I will contact the ladies that I know are praying and say, here's what's going on. I need prayer, which is exactly what I did. Let me tell you what's going on. I didn't go into great detail. They don't need me to word them to death. Right? And this is exactly what's happening. One's got the sniffles, but another one's coughing. And then we got a sore throat with one. We went, no, 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 no. We got issues. Right? We have an enemy, and, and we're falling sick. And we need hope, and we need help, and we need healing. And um, those women began to pray. So that night, after I had this word from the Lord, I got in bed. And, y'all, and I thought, I'm going to, okay, we're going to make the turn. I'm feeling bad but I'm gonna make the turn. I woke up twice in the night and both those times, I cannot tell you how bad I felt. I was running a fever so high. We had, we had bought a bunch of thermometers. I did not have one. We had given them out to everyone. So I didn't have one. It was good that I didn't because I felt like it would have been 108 <laughs> and I would have had to rush to the emergency room. That's the way I felt. I had to get in the, sh I was so, I was shaking so bad because of the fever and sweating so bad that I couldn't, I couldn't stop shaking. I couldn't stop shaking. And I felt, y'all, the second time I woke up, every muscle in my body ached. Every muscle. I mean, every, uh, my legs, my arms, I felt awful. And I, 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 just, I, just, I just said, I've got it and I've got it bad. I'm not going to be one as a mild case. I, I'm going to be one. I'm really, really sick. And I lay there. It kept me. I lay there thinking, I've got to tell Alan, you know, I'm, 
I've got to, I've got to be quarantined. Y'all have got to say, I'm unclean. you got to throw me outside the city. <laughs> I have the flu and the epizooty. <laughs> and it was awful. I couldn't sleep. It was terrible. I, I don't know in my adult life if I felt that bad. I, I don't remember feeling that bad. And um, so I lay there with all the thoughts of what this you know, what this would mean. And um, y'all, the following morning, Alan came in. He had, he had made his way to the couch. <coughs> and uh, he came in and he, uh, he woke me up. And y'all, when he woke me up, I was 100% well. never had anything like that happen. As a matter of fact, last night, Alan was, was lying in bed and I was talking to him about sharing this testimony. And I said, I'm, you're going to need to back me up on this. You're going to need to back me up because it's so unbelievable. And he said, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything like it. I was 100%. Now, I put a mask on and I was very thoughtful. I stayed away. I didn't go running right in and breathe on. But I, I felt I didn't have a cough, I didn't have a sniffle, I didn't have a sore throat, I didn't have a headache, I didn't have a chill. I was 100% healed. It was, it was, it was the power of prayer and God was working out his purposes. He was working out his purposes. I want to pray for us, then I want to share a few things before we go. Do you trust him? And if you really, if you're just saying, I want to, I want to, I don't. I walk through some things. How could, how could I, how could you, if you'd walk through what I walked through, you wouldn't trust him. I can understand that. I can understand that mentality. But I want to say to you, he has you in the palm of his hand. And his word to you is that his plans are good and that you can trust him. Everything that's coming to your mind right now, every circumstance, and you're saying, oh, yeah, but that one thing. Alan laughed. He was talking to me about uh, something else. But he said to me, you know, we tend to go to God. He let this week, he said, we tend to go to God. And instead of, we're supposed to cast our cares on him. We're supposed to give them to him. But he said, what we tend to do is we go to him and we show them to him. <laughs> right? Right? I want you to invite your spirit to receive and let me, let me pray for you this morning. Father, we, we come to you as your daughters, your beloved, precious daughters. And we ask just in these moments that you will move. Lord, there's not a woman in this room, not a woman under the sound of my voice that's not dealing with something that's hard to trust you with. Lord, we have doubt, we have questions. God, we need you. Y'all, he's here right in this place the power of his spirit let him minister to you right now I want to say to those of you that are broken hearted over something. There are women in this room that are broken hearted over a prodigal. 
I want to say to you, you can trust him. You can trust him. You can trust him. He's close to the brokenhearted. I promise. When you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the word says you can fear no evil. Why not dissolve into fear? Because you can trust him. For thou art with me. You can trust him. You might be in a place of confusion or chaos. Chaos might reign in your household right now, in your family, in a particular relationship. You might really doubt. The Lord says, trust in me with all your heart. Let me put trust in you. Just like he puts joy in us, he'll put trust in you. He says, trust in me with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, say, tell him, Jesus, you're everything. You're everything. You're everything. You're everything. In all your ways, acknowledge me. And I'll make your path straight. You can trust him. You can trust him. Some trust in chariots and some trust in horses. But we will trust in the name of our God. He's El Shaddai, Almighty One, and El Elyon, the Most High God. You can trust him. David said in Psalm 37, Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by water that sends its root by the stream. It doesn't fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought. It never fails to bear fruit. I declare that as you, in greater and greater measure, trust him, and he'll make you able to do it, no matter what you're walking through. He'll empower you to trust He'll fill you with it. And you'll be like a, a tree planted by streams of water. His leaf doesn't wither. You can trust him. So I want to invite you, whatever it is, whatever it is, that he's, that he's bringing up in your spirit right now. God, we, I just ask for every woman under the sound of my voice, you'll reveal to her an area that she has, she's just not trusting you. God, you are great. You are Jehovah Jireh, the God who can make every provision. You're Jehovah Rapha, the God who brings all healing. You're Jehovah Nisi, whose banner over us is love. You're Jehovah Rohi, the good shepherd. So, Lord, I pray that you will, in these moments, increase our trust. Just increase our trust. Increase our trust. And give us supernatural ability to cast our cares on you. Not, not just to show them to you but to hand them over.
His plans for you are good. His ways are not your ways. Where were you when he laid the foundations of the earth? But his word to you is that he chose you. He chose you in him before he laid that foundation. And he adopted you into his family. So, Lord, I ask in these moments that you'd fill your daughters. Fill us afresh. Fill us afresh with your power to trust. Lord, fill our mouths and our minds with your greatness. God, we know you are good. Let us also know that we know that we know that you are great that you are more than enough. And that will be more than enough for us. God, I ask that not a woman under the sound of my voice would, would leave this morning as she came in. Lord, that, that our faith would be increased to such measure that we would go forth leaping, jumping and leaping, and praising you in the Spirit. And watching, watching for what you're going to do. Lord, we ask for signs and wonders. May miracles abound. And open the eyes of our heart to see them. That will just, we'll step into a cycle of our faith being increased. And we'll see more and we'll have more faith. We praise you. For you are good. You are good. You are good. You are good. You're the father of lights in whom there's no shadow of turning. You can be no other. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for making a way. Thank you. In the wonderful and precious name of Jesus. And all his daughters said together, Amen, Amen. amen.